very much for inviting me back. Um, uh, we had a long discussion about what would be most beneficial for us to talk about, so we'll dive in. I'm going to try to answer a host of different questions. So why is exercise important was one of the first questions um, that was posed. So physical exercise has health benefits in people, in the general population as well as patients with fatty acid oxidation disorders. And I would like to propose that you consider it an important component of your treatment for your disorder. Um, but we all know that we're somewhat right walking a tightrope, right? We want to have uh, plenty of exercise to promote health and the health advantages of exercise, but not too much that's going to send um, your child or you yourself into rhabdomyolysis. So we're balancing that at enough activity and not too much that's going to um, cause harm. And for each person, I think you're going to have to kind of find that balance yourself. There's not a, a formula that you're going to be able to say for every person, this is the right amount of activity or this is, is uh, too much. So I'm going to talk about different types of, of activity. We're going to talk about resistance um, exercise. So that would be like lifting weights, yoga, uh, 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 core workout, something like that. We'll talk about cardio, and when I'm talking about cardio, I'm kind of lumping a lot of different things together. It could be um, cycling, it could be uh, running, it could be a treadmill, so something where your heart rate's up for a prolonged period of time. And then I'll briefly mention the high intensity interval training, which is a, a, a popular um, exercise right now, where you do two to three minutes of a high intensity um, bout of activity, and then you pause for a minute or two, and then you do two or three more minutes. So it's on, off, on, off, but for a shorter period of time. So we'll kind of delve into all these different types of exercise. So why is exercise important? Um, so when we exercise, um, we actually increase the number of mitochondria in our muscle cells. So if you look at this picture um, on your left, and let's say you have a, a muscle cell at rest, and we have a few mitochondria, and picture those little yellow shapes in the cell, um, and so you have a little bit of fatty acid oxidation in each of those mitochondria. So patients with fatty acid oxidation disorders don't have zero fatty acid oxidation. It's low, usually 10% of normal, but it's not zero. So you have a little bit of fat oxidation in each of those little mitochondria in your cells. But then when you exercise and you work out, the stimulus of exercise increases the number of mitochondria in your cells. So your cells make more mitochondria. So if you look on the picture on your right, over here, uh, you have more mitochondria in each of those cells. So just by exercise, you increase the number of mitochondria in your muscle cells, and each of those mitochondria have 10% activity. So now you have a larger um, capacity to burn a little bit of fat because you've increased the mitochondria in your cells. So one of the reasons exercise is really beneficial is that it, it does this, um, induces mitochondrial proliferation in your muscle cells. So again, why I'd like to emphasize, I would consider exercise a component of your treatment for um, a fatty acid oxidation disorder. So what is the evidence to support this? So this is a complicated figure. I'll try to walk you through it. Um, I took it from a paper that looked at um, high intensity interval training in patients with primary mitochondrial disease. So this is not fatty acid oxidation, but complex one or um, complex two deficiency. And this paper, they looked at patients that they trained with high intensity interval training for uh, two weeks. And they did muscle biopsies, and they looked to see how much change in mitochondria there was after two weeks of high-intensity interval training. And what you can see on the top graph in A is the, the um, activity of citrate synthase, an uh, enzyme in the mitochondria, went up with activity. So before exercise, it was lower, and after two weeks of training, they had more citrate, citrate synthase activity. And then in B, you can see the white bars are pre-training and the black bars are after training. And you see an increase in a number of different mitochondrial proteins, shown on the, the little blots, the western blots over here. I don't think you can see my pointer, but 
um, you see this increase in mitochondria. So this is just one example of two weeks of training and someone with a mitochondrial disease had an increase in the number of mitochondria by doing exercise. So exercise can be a benefit um, by increasing the number of mitochondria in um, skeletal muscle. So what about the effects of cardiac training? So this um, has been known for a while in the exercise literature. So when you do cardiac uh, training, whether that's routine um, walking, uh, biking, uh, running, uh, what that does is it does increase the ability, to, it increases the fatty acid oxidation system. You can burn a little bit more fat. Even if you have a fatty acid oxidation disorder, you're still going to be increasing that little bit of fat oxidation that you have. Now this figure is from um, patients who, are, who don't have a disease, so this is normal trained athletes. And what happens over time, in the trained athlete, you can see the blue part is the amount of fat they can burn. So they, they can increase how much they can burn total. So if you look at the bar, it's a little bit higher, but the amount of fat they burn with training is higher. Um, so untrained versus trained, you increase the ability to um, use fat and you burn more oxygen as you're, as you're training. So all of these effects are going to improve um, how you feel, your ability to do activities of daily living. Um, so exercise is going to really benefit patients with fatty acid oxidation disorders. So what about resistance training? We've talked about increasing mitochondria with cardiac workouts, with high intensity interval training. What happens with resistance training? Let's say you go and you do push-ups or you do uh, sit-ups. How does that affect your muscle? Um, well, this uh, figures to show that uh, before training, your muscles store carbohydrate in the form of glycogen in your muscles. Um, and the muscle fibers after resistance training increase their glycogen stores. So you store more carbohydrate after you've started um, doing resistance exercise and you have more protein synthesis. So the muscle fibers get a little bit bigger and they store more carbohydrates. So both of those things are gonna help you do exercise better. So as you're doing resistance training, you're increasing your carbohydrate stores and you're causing an increase in protein synthesis in that muscle. So this is an example from another uh, paper, again, in primary mitochondrial disease. This is a, a really interesting study. It's from a little while ago, 2009. Um, but Dr. Jepson is a very well-known exercise scientist. And he did three to six months of training. But what he did is he, he had patients train, do resistance training. And then he had them stop and do deconditioning. And then he had them start training again. And, and all this time he was looking at the changes in muscle um, in these patients. So each of these time points is a patient. It was five patients with, again, a primary mitochondrial disease. And the first point on the graph is pre-training. And so you see all the lines go up. So they have an increase in, in glycogen. They have an increase in mitochondria after three months of training. And then they didn't do any training. And you see it drop again with deconditioning. And they start training again, and then they he measured again at three months, and you see the lines going up, and then at 12 months, the lines going up even further. So the message was that training increased their uh, mitochondria, their glycogen stores, deconditioning, in other words, not stopping training, it went back down the baseline, and then training again was able to increase it. So exercise improves um, the performance of the muscle in patients, um, in this case with mitochondrial disease, and in patients with fatty acid oxidation disorders as well. So the effects of strength training or resistance training would be to increase glycolytic enzymes, you can burn carbohydrate, and store more glycogen, increases muscle capacity to store glycogen and improves protein synthesis. So all types of exercise are beneficial, um, whether it's cardio, high intensity interval training, or resistance training, they all have positive effects on muscle. So let's talk about exercise in sports. Um, so most sports like tennis, swimming, basketball, any sort of team sport is really a mix, right? So it's not pure cardio and it's not pure resistance, it's some of both. 
So if you're on the field playing a sport, let's say soccer, you might be running for a little bit, so that's a, a fast cardiac workout, but then you might be stopping and doing some, some training exercises with your coach, and that might be a little bit more resistance. So most sports are not a pure cardio or resistance, they're a bit of a mix. And when you play those types of sports, you're getting the same benefits that you would get from doing a more um, structured, just resistance workout or, or cardio workout. So I think playing sports can um, be a great form of exercise as well as um, social event for a lot for kids. So my take home points for this first part of the talk is that I, I'd like you to consider routine exercise as an important part of treatment for fatty acid oxidation disorder. Strength training increases muscle glycogen and protein synthesis, so it builds stronger muscles that store more carbohydrate. Cardio training increases mitochondria and the ability to burn fat, so all of these have health benefits um, for your muscles. So let's now kind of move into how do you navigate that? So, so exercise is good, how do you navigate that if you are a parent and you have a child who wants to play a sport? So the first thing I would say is I'd encourage your, your child to play an activity that they like to do. If there's a, a sport they want to try, I would encourage, um, encourage you to let them give it a, give it a try. Um, a couple of things you're going to hear me say over and over again, you always want to practice or exercise fed and hydrated. So you don't want to go to, to the training having not had a snack or not eaten before you're going to go exercise. So always exercise fed and hydrated. Um, I usually plan breaks um, if you're going to do long training sessions. Most younger kids aren't going to have exercise you know, more than 45 minutes to an hour, but I try to build in breaks about every 45 minutes to an hour. And I would discuss this ahead of time. So just like we heard this morning, making a plan. So discussing it both with your child who's playing the sport, but I would discuss it with the coach. Um, so as the parent, I would certainly go talk to the coach and say we need to build in some, some breaks um, every 45 to a minutes um, to an hour where they can sit down, drink something, maybe have a small snack. Um, I think one thing is obvious and I think we've learned really well from COVID is it's not good to go exercise either if you're sick, right? So if you're sick, stay home and, and call your coach and say I can't come to practice, I'm not feeling well. And I think if all of us did that a little bit better, it would, it would be... Um, We'd avoid some complications. And then I think the times that I see kids get into trouble when they're playing sports, probably more often, is long tournament or competition days. So if you got a bus and you got to go a long ways to a tournament or it's multiple games back to back, I think that's one time you need just to be really vigilant, um, have those extra snacks, and, and be sure that you're discussing, making sure they have breaks in between different um, activities. So uh, a couple of uh, stories, I, I had um, one parent tell me that they, her daughter really wanted to play basketball um, and she had a long conversation with the coach and there were a couple of times where the fast presses up and down the court were, were challenging for her um, and the coach was, was willing and worked with her to have her not maybe do all the fast presses up and down the, co the court. Maybe she would be in and do a few, but then later in the game she would just stay at one end, end to guard the basket. So there was some give and take and when, she, when the mom discussed it with the, with the coach. And I think the coach then became really very aware of watching that, that young girl playing basketball and kind of knowing when to, to pull back a little bit. So that was a great positive experience for that family and the coach was willing to work with them. So I think having those discussions with coaches is really important and, and a lot of coaches want your child, they want your child and the team to be successful. So having those discussions up, up front can be um, quite helpful. Um, and another family I think told me about softball, they, um, worked out where um, their child would bat but someone else would run just because that was a little difficult for them. So again, that was something that, that seemed to work pretty well and they were able to participate and be a part of the team. So I, again, I would really encourage you to, to work that out both with your child and with the coach um, of, a, of a young child playing a sport. But the sport overall, exercise is good. 
and keeping some of these things in mind, I think you can be build in both the social event as well as really um, providing that exercise, that stimulus to, to make more mitochondria and muscle cells. So what about if, as you move into middle school, high school, as a teen, young adult? So I think when we start getting into those um, ages, coaches don't really want to deal so much with parents. And so I think the teen and the, and the, the patient is really going to have to be their own advocate and go talk to coaches. And that can be, that can be challenging and difficult for uh, a high schooler or a middle schooler. But I know uh, when my kids are playing sports, they, the parents were told, you know, we don't want to talk to you. you your, your child has to be the one that's coming to us. So I think that encouraging your teenager um, to talk to coaches, to tell them what um, is going on, and to try to come up with a plan is a great first step to being a good self-advocate um, when playing sports. Again, I think sports are a great form of exercise, but having a plan in place is really critical. I'll repeat the same thing. You always want to go to training or to competition, fed and well hydrated. Have a plan in place, such as snacks and, and drinks for um, breaks in the tournament or breaks in the game. Um, and I think the biggest thing that uh, we talked a lot about in the team room is listening to your body. And if you know you've done too much, stop. Tell the coach you've got to you've got to come out and and uh, listen to what you're feeling. So don't continue to push if you know that it's it's been a little bit too much. Um, I think at this age, when you start getting into high school sports, this is a great time to start monitoring your heart rate. So one way to determine how hard you're exercising is to watch your heart rate. And we're going to go through that exercise in just a minute to try to figure out what's a good target heart rate. Um, and I think you can start doing that as a, te as a teenager, and it would be a great um, skill to take on into adulthood, to be able to, to monitor um, heart rate during exercise. So what about exercise as an adult? Uh, after we get into professional life, I know all of us struggle for fitting in exercise into our regular routine life, but I think as an adult with a fatty acid oxidation disorder, making time to exercise is really important. And again, consider it part of your treatment of your um, disorder. For adults, I would recommend alternating either cardio or high intensity interval training with some resistance training. So you might do cardio a couple days a week and resistance training a couple days a week and alternating those. And I would certainly recommend monitoring your heart rate while you're doing those activities. Um, I would try to find something you like and you enjoy doing. All of us do exercise more often and regularly if it's something we like. So if you can find that one exercise that you really enjoy as an adult, I think you're much more likely to stick with it. So those would be my tips for exercise um, in adults. So are some exercises better than others? This was one of the questions that was posed. Um, all, I think I've hopefully driven home the point that all exercise has benefits, whether it's cardio, whether it's resistance training, there are benefits to skeletal muscle. I think the biggest thing is to find an exercise that is sustainable. So one that you can enjoy doing and continue doing on a regular basis. Uh, the study I showed about the deconditioning, so stopping exercise, we have a loss of those mitochondria and muscle cells. They really um, decline with deconditioning. So my recommendation is finding that thing that you can do that's sustainable, that you enjoy doing. And then mixing um, cardio and resistance training. So having a variety of different exercises uses different muscle groups and it has different um, benefits, so I would um, encourage different types of, of exercise. All right, so let's do a, a, a calculation, a few little calculations. So let's say you want to try to monitor your heart rate during moderate intensity exercise, and um, you want to know what that heart rate might, might be. So all of you can do this right now in your heads. If you take 220, minus your aging years, that is an estimate of your max heart rate. Okay, that's the estimate of your max heart rate. So, younger people have a higher max heart rate than older people, if you calculate that formula out. And then take that, whatever that max heart rate is, and multiply it by 0.6. It's 
So 60% of your max heart rate is a great place, a good range to shoot for. Now you can go plus or minus that about 10%, but you're really shooting for that 50 to 70% max heart rate. So 220 minus your age and years is your max heart rate times 0 0.6, that's your, your target range you're, hunt, you're hunting for, and you want to do a, a, an exercise that, that's maintaining your heart rate around that 60% uh, max for about 45 minutes to an hour before you take a break. That would be a, a, a moderate intensity exercise if, you, if you're able to do that. Now, I know there are people in the audience and people probably watching online where 45 minutes to an hour is way too long. That would be really pushing you to a point where you're hurting a little bit too much. So I would encourage you to start slow. If, if 10 minutes is what you can do, then start with 10 minutes. And do that for a couple of weeks and then build by five minutes a couple of weeks later. But every time you're exercising, pushing yourself just a little, uh, a little bit longer. So start slow. You can start with 10 minutes. You can start with 20 minutes and build on that as you uh, continue to exercise. Yeah. Point six. You got a decimal point problem. I got a decimal point problem. Yes, you're right. You are correct. Thank you for catching that. You're right. I have a decimal point problems. It's point six. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, okay. So what about the different disorders? Um, is it different for exercising if you have MCAD versus VLCAD, LCAD, or say GA2? So I kind of drew a, a line over here. You can see um, as far as more energy reserves or less energy reserves. And I had to have my obligate biochemical pathway. So here's my slide with the, with the pathway. I put a box with um, CP2, VLCAD, um, LCAD, trifunctional protein up at the top. So when we bring fat into our mitochondria, those are the first enzymes that break those long chain fats down into energy. So obviously if you have a defect in one of those enzymes, then your ability to burn fat is more impaired than say with MCAD where you can make a little bit of energy before you get to a medium chain fat. So I think of um, MCAT having a little bit more reserves, a little bit more energy reserves. Um, CPD2, VLCAT, LCAT, and TFP, a little less. But everything feeds in ultimately into the respiratory chain over here in the ETF protein where I've illustrated GA2. So everything is sort of impacted with GA2. So they have probably lower um, energy reserves. So you may need to start off a little slower with exercise if you're um, with say GA2 or trifunctional protein if you have a little bit more deconditioning. Go a little slower, build a little slower. Exercise still has benefits, but it might be slightly different for every patient and it might be slightly different depending on uh, your disorder. So my take home points for this particular section is that to try to find the routine exercise that your child really enjoys, wants to do, uh, or the one that you like to do and is sustainable that you can continue to exercise. Always, always exercise fed and hydrated. So make sure you're not going to practice or to a game rushing and you're missing those snacks or water that you might need. Uh, I'd schedule regular breaks and I think it's important to have discussions with coaches about that. Uh, listen to your body. I think you know better than um, anyone else if you feel like you've done too much and you need to stop or um, that you know, the game's going a little long and you need to come out. That's hard to do. I know as an athlete you want to compete for your team, but I would really encourage you to just stop and really listen to your body. And do not exercise if you feel ill or sick in any way. So really being careful about um, not exercising when you don't feel well. So now we'll go into nutrition before, after, during exercise. So a little bit more my wheelhouse. So we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. So I found these interesting um, handouts. These are from the Dairy Council, and I think they, they drive home the point um, pretty well. 
So three to four hours before exercise, especially if this is kids and they're exercising after school or in the evenings, um, you want to think about planning a, a, a high carbohydrate with some protein type of meal. So some suggestions would be you know, turkey sandwich with apple, low fat chocolate milk. I crossed out the peanut butter, just peanut butter tends to be a little bit too high in fat. Banana slices, low fat milk, Greek yogurt, berries, a lot of stuff we've had. Fruit is excellent, we've had a bunch of that today. Um, and then drinking lots of fluids. Say 20, 30 minutes before exercise, you might have like Gatorade or some sort of sports drinks, fruit, again, fruit snacks, a small granola bar. We talked a little bit about that in the teen room. There were some great suggestions for different types of low fat granola bars. So this is a handout from UT Southwestern for their fatty acid oxidation um, patients and they have a list of, of low fat granola bars here. So um, having granola bars and yogurt your, or a Gatorade in your backpack if you're going to sports is a great way to have snacks on hand. So what about during exercise? If you're gonna exercise for 45 minutes to an hour, um, I, I don't know that it's necessary that you stop and take a break. If it's longer than that, then yes, you really wanna plan breaks. So, um, you know, tournaments, several soccer games, those usually are lasting longer than 45 minutes and you wanna plan um, breaks in between. So if it's a sustained exercise, like um, stop and football, soccer, field hockey, you want to take those breaks and have small amounts of carbs, so a couple gulps of sports like Gatorade, applesauce, apple pou sauce pouches, uh, maybe go back to that granola bar, oh, that might not feel good on your stomach while you're exercising. So something easily digested, quick um, uh, carbohydrates and electrolytes is great. For long endurance events, um, I would be really careful with these and again, make sure that you're taking breaks every hour with a little bit larger of a snack, whether that's a banana or some uh, raisin, something a little bit um, more substantial if you're gonna go more than an hour and a half. So let's talk about um, hydration. I think that's really to have a mix of carbohydrate and protein for recovery. So some ideas, um, the Dairy Council has done a lot of work on chocolate milk being a great you know, recovery <laughs> beverage. Uh, there's all kinds of different things you can do. Um, yogurt with fruit, there's, you can even go um, like a more substantial meal. Eggs are, egg whites are great protein, um, so. Uh, that with some carbs, uh, or like a bowl with rice, beans, um, that type of thing would also be a great option as well. So 45 minutes after a major workout, recovery fuel, being a mix of carbohydrates and protein is, is great for increasing muscle protein synthesis, <coughs> restoring those glycogen stores in your muscle and getting you set up for that next workout um, in, in a day or two. So this is a handout that they put together at OHSU for our FAO patients, and it gives some examples of pre-work exercise and post-exercise uh, fueling. So you could use, um, for long chain defects, a little bit of MCT mixed in Gatorade, um, and then after exercise, chocolate milk, apples with pretzels, berries, Greek yogurt, fruit smoothies, uh, whole wheat toast and um, egg whites, something like that. So that mix of carbohydrate and protein for recovery is really beneficial for your muscles. Uh, so low, lean protein sources. We talked a little bit about this in the, in the teen room as well. So protein, a lot of protein tends to be a bit higher in fat, so that's one of the challenges, finding those low fat uh, protein sources. Um, so, <coughs> Here's a handout that was put together, again, I think by um, UT for their fatty acid oxidation patients. And I would look for um, low, fat, low fat dairy is a good option, beans, uh, really lean chicken, uh, egg whites, those types of things are the protein that sources that I tend to go to. So finding those lean sources of protein that you can include um, and, and avoiding more of the high protein uh, or high fat protein sources. 
So my final take home points are to plan nutrition during for the phases of exercise. So you're really thinking about, okay, how do I feel before I exercise? Do I need to take a break during that um, sport or exercise that I'm doing? And then what am I gonna do for recovery afterwards? Um, a mix of carbohydrate and protein is really important for um, muscle repair after exercise. And for long chain defects, you can use a little MCT and C7 prior to exercise, and we've definitely shown a benefit from having MCT um, and C7 prior, right before you exercise, um, mixed with some sort of uh, carbohydrate beverage. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate before, during, and after exercise. And then that recovery um, mix of carbohydrate and protein to build muscle and replenish your glycogen stores um, when you're done. I think that might be it. Um, so what's coming on the horizon for exercise? I think last year I talked a little bit about the study from the Netherlands that looked at oral ketones. Um, ketones are a source of energy that um, those of us have protein for recovery. So some ideas, um, the Dairy Council has done a lot of work on chocolate milk being a great you know, recovery beverage. Uh, there's all kinds of different things you can do. Um, yogurt with fruit. There's you could even go um, like a more substantial meal. Eggs are egg whites are great protein. Um, so uh, that with some carbs uh, or like a bowl with rice, beans, um, that type of thing would also be a great option as well. So 45 minutes after a major workout, recovery fuel being a mix of carbohydrates and protein is, is great for increasing muscle protein synthesis, restoring those glycogen stores in your muscle and getting you set up for that next workout um, in, the, in a day or two. So this is a handout that they put together at OHSU for our FAO patients and it gives some examples of pre-work exercise and post-exercise uh, Fueling, so you could use um, for long chain defects a little bit of MCT mixed in Gatorade, um, and then after exercise, chocolate milk, apples with pretzels, berries, Greek yogurt, fruit smoothies, um, whole wheat toast, and um, egg whites, something like that. So that mix of carbohydrate and protein for recovery is really beneficial for your muscles. Uh, so low, lean protein sources. We talked a little bit about this in the, in the teen room as well. So protein, a lot of protein tends to be a bit higher in fat. So that's one of the challenges, finding those low fat uh, protein sources. Um, so here's a handout that was put together, again, I think by um, UT for their fatty acid oxidation patients. And I would look for um, low fat Low fat dairy is a good option, beans, uh, really lean chicken, uh, egg whites, those types of things are the protein that sources that I tend to go to. So finding those lean sources of protein that you can include um, and, and avoiding more of the high protein uh, or high fat protein sources. So my final take home points are to plan nutrition during for the phases of exercise. So you're really thinking about, okay, how do I feel before I exercise? Do I need to take a break during that um, sport or exercise that I'm doing? And then what am I gonna do for recovery afterwards? Um, a mix of carbohydrate and protein is really important for um, muscle repair after exercise. And for long chain defects, you can use a little MCT and C7 prior to exercise, and we've definitely shown the benefit from having MCT um, and C7 prior, right before you exercise, um, mixed with some sort of uh, carbohydrate beverage. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate before, during, and after exercise. And then that recovery um, mix of carbohydrate and protein to build muscle and replenish your glycogen stores um, when you're done. I think that might be it. Um, so what's coming on the horizon for exercise? I think last year I talked a little bit about the study from the Netherlands that looked at oral ketones. Uh, ketones are a source of energy that um, those of us um, who exercise without a fatty acid oxidation disorder make by burning fats and, and ketones go up during exercise. 
But if you have a fatty acid oxidation disorder, you can't make ketones. So oral ketones would be a way to, to provide that energy source without, um, when you have a fatty acid oxidation disorder. So we are starting a study, we're recruiting right now for a um, oral ketone study and exercise among patients with long chain fatty acid oxidation disorders. So I think that's a supplement that's coming on the horizon uh, down the line where we're going to look to replace, to provide ketones before exercise to see if that can improve the ability of patients to exercise uh, safely and prevent rhabdomyolysis as well as um, improve their ability to exercise. So that's kind of the future for exercise science in this area. And with that, I'm going to close, and then I'd be happy to talk about any questions that we might have. Well, it's, yes, I can hear you. There you go. Um, wait, please. Yes, turn off. Hello. Okay. <laughs> I have five seconds. What? Push, push the bottom of it for holding it for five oh, seconds. Oh, I didn't hold it Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. A couple of quick questions, I hope. You talked about the balance for each person to know how much they can tolerate. When you're starting out and you're trying to find that balance, how do you differentiate between this is just normal kind of wear and tear because I'm exercising and doing something different versus this is rapto and I need to chill out without like checking for CK or urine. Is there a way to know as you're trying to find that balance? So I asked that question just in the team room just this morning. How do oh. you know when it's muscle soreness versus rapto? And the response was, you know. So uh -huh. I think, I, okay. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I've never had rapto myself. So I think that's a, it's a difficult balance. How do you decide when it's just muscle soreness versus rapto? Uh, for those of you that have had it, um, maybe you can help. Um, this mom out because I don't know it's it's hard to tell but uh, so I don't have okay. a, I don't have a good way to, to answer that question yeah okay okay second question for younger kids pain and six when does recess stop being enough for like exercise right because that's like that's how he's getting it and he's not in the gym in the treadmill you know right. so if that's an important component of treatment when does recess stop being so enough so when he's six play is his exercise right? yeah you said he doesn't stop moving no so I I would actually let him be the driver of that. If okay. one of his friends are starting to play Little League or you know his friends are starting to be on a soccer team and he wants to try it, then I would I would let him be the driver of that. I think when they're little, they just play as their exercise. Right. They're playing at recess, they run around the playground, um, they go to swim parties. So yeah. I think that's kind of their normal their normal exercise. Okay, one last question. Sorry. So you talked about the break when they're out doing activity, 45 to 45 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. With sun and heat, and Georgia, it's super hot. Does that at all impact Absolutely. how much? So should we be taking a break at 30 minutes, for maybe versus 45? Or um, you know, I don't know that I would say necessarily need to shorten it that much, but I do think extreme temperatures on either side. So I have lots of um, patients who say they tend to struggle, um, say when they're skiing, when it's cold or if it's really hot. Um, so I think extreme temperatures on either side, it increases your energy expenditure, um, either to cool yourself down in hot temperatures or to maintain your heat in, in cold temperatures. So I think temperature definitely plays a role and you could shorten it. Again, trying to help him learn to listen to his body and say, okay, it's really hot, I need to take a break a little earlier because it's, it's an extreme temperature, but definitely plays a big role. Okay, we have Addison here, and Addison is going to share with us what... what How do you tell the difference between muscle soreness and rapid? Yeah, she's going to tell us what rapid feels like. Yeah. Okay, so um, muscle soreness, it's a bit different. It feels like you can kind of stretch it out more, and when you move, it's not as restricting. But for rhabdo, I know it feels like you're a lot weaker, but it still hurts, and it's a little sharper, and you just you feel like it's not going to go away anytime soon until you get food. So muscle soreness is that lactate, lactic acid build up in your muscle and you can stretch and move that out and it's going to feel better. So thank you very much. I think that's really helpful for all of us who haven't had Rob Dota to think about.
Hi, Christy Abrams. Um, I realized yesterday I never introduced myself, so if anybody doesn't know me, I have four kids, two have Elchad. Um, so my questions are, obviously I'm busy with my kids and they are pretty active in sports. And so say practice is like six to eight at night, would you suggest eating dinner before or after practice? Obviously eating a snack either before or after, but would it be better to eat? So that makes sense, like eat dinner at five or eat dinner at 8.30 and snack vice versa. So that's a great question. And I don't think there's a, a golden rule. Um, I think it's really gonna kind of depend on your whole say, you know, small dinner at 5 and snack at 8.30 or vice versa, snack at 5 and small dinner at 8.30, but you're eating both before and after. Okay, and then my second question would be, if they had to grab a quick snack on their way out the door, would it be better for them to drink Gatorade, eat a carb, or a fruit? Mm. Well, my dietitian hat on me always falls back on the fruit because of the other micronutrients in the fruit, but I think, again, the sustainability. Uh, you know, if you've got a, a banana that you can grab real quick there, that's great, but if not, then the Gatorade can do a great stand-in, and there are electrolytes in both, so. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi. Um, I don't, this might not be a question, but have you found, have there been any studies about time of day of exercise? Because I found with my kids, if they have gym class early in the morning at school, they do better than if it's at, towards the end of the day, even if it's right after lunch. It's interesting that you ask that question. There's no literature, there's no research study that I know of that has done it based on time of day. But some of my initial observations, one of the reasons I started our initial MCT um, study was that I noticed that kids got rhabdo much more often at 5, 6 p.m. It was never in the morning, it was always after the whole day. And I couldn't tell, was it just because they'd been at school all day and they'd been playing and everything, and then rhabdo shows up. I don't know if Jerry, you've seen that, but it's always in the evening. They show up in the ER with rhabdo. It's not usually in the morning. But no, we've never researched that. But it is something I've observed that it tends to happen later in the day. Is that because it's a cumulative effect of a little bit less energy than expended, they've been in school, you know, who, know, who knows exactly why? And if they exercise in the morning, that wouldn't happen? I don't know that we know that. But it does seem to happen later in the day. Thanks. So I have one question from our virtual attendees, and then we're going to move on to our next Agenda item. So the question is, is it more, are you more likely to get rhabdo from exceeding exercise than from fasting? Ooh, good, good question. Um, I don't know that I know for sure. I, I, think it, I think it depends a lot on the age. I think that fasting has a bigger impact younger and exercise has a bigger impact older. So my guess would be, in a school-age kid, fasting might be the bigger driver, and in a teen adult, it's going to be over exercise. But that's just my gut, and I don't know that I have data that I can point you to to nail that down. Thank you so much, Dr. Gillingham. We appreciate you, and Dr. Gillingham will be around, so please find her, ask questions, and. If you're